coches, buenas noches, ¿cómo están? Gracias por estar aquí en esta clínica. Al final de cuentas, la cuarentena nos está sirviendo algo, ¿no? Veo muchos nombres de reconocidos coaches de nuestro país, coaches de Liga Mayor, coaches de la Liga Profesional. Les agradezco a todos que estén aquí. También a los coaches de otros países. Por del ataque, insiste, al igual que muchos coaches más, ha decidido compartir su conocimiento y también invitar a grandes coaches para compartir el suyo, como es el caso de hoy con el coach Derek Jones. A pesar que esta pandemia nos hizo mantenernos en casa, todos eh, hemos continuado trabajando hasta el momento. Hemos llegado con nuestro sistema de tacleo a lugares que no habríamos imaginado hace algunos meses. Por del ataque, insisten, ya es conocido en 15 países de Centro, Sudamérica, Europa, Asia y hasta en los Emiratos Árabes Unidos. Dubai, con la única razón de proteger a los jugadores de los golpes repetidos en la cabeza y sus terribles consecuencias. El día de hoy tenemos la presencia de coaches de España, Italia, Chile, Perú, Bolivia, Venezuela, Ecuador y por supuesto de México. Sin más preámbulos, les presento a nuestro gran invitado de hoy, el coach Derek Jones, un coach exitoso y además amigo mío. El coach eh, Jones es head coach asociado, coordinador co-defensivo y coach de DBs en los Riders de Texas Tech. Estuvo por varios años también como head coach asociado con el coach David Goodfly en los Blue Devils de Duke. En su época de jugador lo hizo con los Rebels de All Miss. Y pues la razón por la que invité al coach, al coach Derek Jones es porque me impresiona su filosofía y capacidad para motivar a los demás. Lo conocí hace algunos años en AFCA, y entré a su presentación y quedé verdaderamente sorprendido de todo lo que dijo. Jugar siempre para ganar es su lema. Always place to win es su lema. Significa pensar en el futuro, tomar decisiones sabias, mantener una actitud positiva. Hacer sacrificios, prestar atención a los detalles, hacer las pequeñas cosas bien, liderar con el ejemplo, rodearse de las personas adecuadas, ser un buen amigo, esposo y padre. En fin, Always Place to Win es su forma de vida. Vamos a poner un pequeño video. Always Play to Win has been my motto, um, no matter what I do. Whether it be in sports, whether it be in school, whether it be in life, it's about doing things to finish. Um, everything's not always going to go your way. Um, you're not always going to wake up in a good mood. There are going to be some negative things that take place, but it's all a part of life, and life is about overcoming. So always play to win is just a statement that relates to everything in life, and it's something that everybody in life can relate to. You know, the need to inspire people comes from things that people have given to me. I know uh, oftentimes growing up and even as an adult, people have said and did things that uh, naturally inspired me. And being able to give that back is something that, you know, is free and easy to do. I think when you look at the things in life that really, really matter, something or someone has inspired you to do it. It can oftentimes be from a coach, it can be from a teacher, it can be from a mentor or anybody else. And I was fortunate to have people in my life that gave me these things growing up, but I'm also um, of the knowledge that a lot of people don't have those things. So if I can act as a friend, if I can act as a mentor, if I can act as a parent with my words, I just feel like it's very, very easy for me to do. You know, the whole purpose of Always Play to Win just stemmed from who I am as a person. And I think this book is about who I am, you know, a person that's always positive. And I try to always think in a positive manner. You know, so many times in life you see people that are down. You see people that need a little bit of motivation. I just think it's something that, you know, speaks volumes to a lot of people that um, maybe it'll enable somebody to say some things that they don't quite know how to put into words to their own children. Maybe it'll enable a coach to be able to motivate his team in a way that he's never thought about. And again, it's just blessings that I've received in my life that I'm trying to pass on to others. This is something that a mother can pass to their daughters. This is something that a father can pass to their sons. This is something that a coach can use um, in sports and just an endless opportunity for small words to affect people in a variety of different ways. All yours. Good evening, guys. 
appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, it's an honor to be able to um, join with guys from across the world um, who all have the common goal. You know, coaching is something that is a blessing for all of us. And it's something that allows us to touch young men uh, in a lot of different ways. You know, coaching is one of those things that what you learn from the sport becomes a big part of who you become as a man. And I'm very, very grateful for a lot of the lessons that I learned um, through sports because, you know, father time at some point is going to catch up with this from an ability standpoint. But the lessons that you learn enable you to become a better teacher, a better coach, a better husband, a better father, or whatever it is that you choose to do. So what I want to talk to you guys tonight about is the profit of a positive mindset. You know, as leaders, as coaches, we have the power to brighten someone's day or ruin someone's day by our attitude or mood. And I think that's very important that we all understand that, you know, for what we do. You know, there's always going to be some negative things that go on in our life, but coaching is a blessing and coaching is a privilege. But with coaching comes responsibility. And it's bigger than knowing how to play the actual game. It's bigger than technique. It's bigger than fundamentals. It's about attitude because those are the things that you're going to profit from many, many years after the other aspects of the game's gone. So for me, I think it's important that we understand that we can learn a lot about what to do and what not to do from other coaches and other people that we observe. You know, for me, I've always wanted to take things from coaches that motivated me with their words, but also motivated me with their actions. You know, one of the things I'm very adamant about is nothing positive comes from negativity. You know, you can teach somebody something but the way you go about it is very, very important. I think you have to understand that it's very important that you grasp the respect of the people that you're coaching before you try to get something out of them. Because people are way more open to giving you their all when they know that you care about them, when they know that you have their best interests at heart, and when they know that everything that you're saying is genuine. I think if you coach for the prestige, if you coach for the money, I think if you coach for the popularity or the thrill, I think you're coaching for the wrong reasons. You have to coach because you're truly passionate about making the difference in the life of the young men that you're coaching. And I think once you grasp the concept of coaching for the right reason, everything else falls into place. You know, we have to be on the same page of understanding that everything is not always going to go our way um, from a coaching standpoint. You can spend endless hours and endless amounts of time preparing to play a game a certain way. And you have things that you expect to happen the way that you envision they're going to happen. And it doesn't happen. You as the leader have to know how to make the young men understand that this is the way life is. Life doesn't always happen the way that we plan. And I think one of the most important things you have to learn in life is that at some point in life, at some time in life, you're going to be faced with adversity. You're not going to know what that adversity is ahead of time, but what you can do, you can prepare yourself to deal with adversity by your mindset. That way, regardless of what adversity comes your way, you're going to be able to deal with it. And oftentimes in our position, the people that we're coaching, the people that we're leading, even in your household with your family, they're going to react how you react. They're going to respond how you respond. So you think about it. I take a lot of my personality from my father. I've never seen my father lose his composure. You know, he's 70 years old, and um, I've seen him angry. I've seen him upset. I've seen him disappointed, but I've never seen him lose his composure. And we never had a talk about that. But one of the most important lessons I've learned from my father is how to carry and conduct yourself when you know that people are learning from your actions. Being a father is not much different than being a coach because oftentimes in coaching, we're the only father that a lot of these young men have. So I think it's very important that we all understand how important it is that we carry and conduct ourselves in a way sometimes that may not be natural, 
because we've accepted the position of being a coach. You know, every day that we wake up, we have a choice. We have a choice to be positive. We have a choice to be negative, regardless of what's happening. You know, I'm sitting in a place now and it's been raining for three days straight. And I can complain about the rain or I can be thankful for the rain. That's my mindset. You know, we're all right now suffering through the aspects of this pandemic. You know, there are people losing jobs. Uh, there are people not having a normal way of life. There's a lot of things that have been thrown off course as a result of this pandemic. But what I look at is we can complain about it, but we can't control it. So what's the profit in complaining about it? One of the things that the pandemic has been able to do for me is I spend so much time coaching. I spend so much time on my job. I spend so much time trying to provide for my family because of my profession that I'm often absent from my family. Well, because of the pandemic and because I've been forced to be in the house, it's allowed me to reconnect with my family. It's allowed me to take my own two daughters and be able to pour into them, to be able to listen to them. It's allowed me to be able to sit down and eat dinner with my family, which is a rarity in our world because I have one daughter in college and because I often work long hours. So for me, it's placed me in a position to where I said, okay, I can't do certain things, but I can do the most important thing in my life. And that's being a positive leader for my family. So for me, as bad as things are with this pandemic, and you know, you have people losing their lives, you have people losing their jobs, you have people sick, which is a tragedy for us all. But for me, it's enabled my daughters to be able to get a portion of their father that they've never had. So that's kind of my attitude about it. And you know, I have no idea when this thing is gonna subside. I have no idea when things are gonna get back to normal, but I don't try to predict that. All I try to worry about is each and every day when I wake up, how can I be better than I was the day before? And knowing that I have daughters in my household who have no idea of how to deal with adversity, because I learned from watching my father, I know that my daughters are watching me. So my attitude, the way I carry myself, the way I conduct myself um, in every single thing that I do has to be one that's reflective of how I feel like I want them to one day do that when I'm not around to tell them. You know, coaching is about teaching and teaching is about reaching. And what I mean by that is, as a coach, we're blessed to be able to teach a lot of different lessons. But the first lesson we have to learn is every single kid that we're coaching is different. And we have to take it upon ourselves to develop personal relationships with these young men to know how to reach them. You're going to have some people that you coach that have gotten lessons from home that others haven't. You're going to have some people that are just born a little more mature than others. As a coach, you have to understand that each individual product that you're blessed to be able to coach is different. You know, coaching is bigger than just instilling a scheme or talking about how to play the game. Coaching is about being able to say 20 years from now, when you see a young man that you've coached, they've learned by the way that you taught them. It may not be the technique, but it's the way you went about teaching the technique. And I think that's a skill in itself. In order to be a good coach, you have to take pride in your ability as a teacher. If you think about it, reflect back to the best teachers that you've had in your life and the ones that made you want to learn. Think back to going to class as a grade student and the teachers that you were excited to go back to see day after day and why. Think about the teachers that were able to present material to you in a way that made you understand. And those are the things that you want to mimic. I think we all have to find people in life that are good at the things that we aspire to be good at in order to be as good as those people. One of the things about coaching is you can't have too much of an ego. You can't have too much pride because when we stop listening, we stop learning. You've always got to be hungry for information and knowledge to be able to give to others. I think one of the biggest mistakes that comes in leadership is oftentimes uh, with leadership comes power. And oftentimes when leaders get power, they become unapproachable. And what I mean by that is they intimidate the people around them from being honest with them. And I think the worst thing you can do as a coach, the worst thing you can do as a leader, 
The worst thing you can do as a husband, the worst thing you can do as a father is to become unapproachable. Because when you become unapproachable, you have now alienated people from telling you the truth about yourself. And I think regardless of how high you rise in the profession, regardless of what you become in life, it's always important that you keep somebody in your life that's honest with you about yourself. Because oftentimes we don't look at ourselves from an outside manner, we look at ourselves from our own set of eyes. And I think when you are open enough to be able to invite someone or someones to critique you, you've opened yourself to constantly get better at what you're doing. Life is ever changing. The young men that you're coaching is forever changing. You have to have somebody around to be able to teach you. And I'm not saying deviate from your core values. I'm not saying deviate from the things that you believe in, but you have to have somebody around you that will enable you to understand some situations better that you may not understand. Regardless of what title or position you hold, nobody has all the answers. The unique thing about coaching is you must be able to motivate people to get them to do what you want them to do. You must be able to motivate them to do things that they don't want to do. And you must be able to motivate them to do things that they don't think that they can do. And that's a lot because you have no idea of how many insecurities live within the people that you're trying to motivate. Therefore, it has to be bigger than the sport. It's got to be about pouring into these people on a regular basis. You know, leadership is about maintaining composure, as I talk to you about. You know, one of the things I tell my players all the time is, if you see me do it, you're allowed to do it. Because I can guarantee them that they're not going to see me lose my composure. If they see me on game day, lose my composure, flip out on a referee, or get us a personal file, they got the right to do that. Because the one thing that I'm in control of is whether or not I do that. I refuse to give any situation or any person to power for me to show weakness. And I think when you lose your composure, you show weakness. And one of the things that we can do every day by the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we act, is we can show the young people that we're dealing with how to be strong. You know, I think it's also important that you understand that coaching is a job, but it's not your life. You know, I don't know how many guys on here are married, but the most important thing that you'll ever be in life is a husband or a father, if you're fortunate enough to be a husband or a father. I feel like I'm a good coach, but I feel like I'm an even better man because being a better man allows you to be a good coach and you have to be able to separate the two. You know, in coaching, you're going to have uh, some good things and some bad things happen. But the one thing that you've always got to be is steady at home. You know, I've made a pact in my life that regardless of what happens on my job, regardless of what the score of a game is, regardless of how well or how bad my guys play, when I get home, I'm going to be the same guy because my family deserves that, because my children deserve that. But more importantly, I deserve that. In order for you to be as good as you can be, one of the things we've all got to understand is the importance of rest and recovery. You know, we were blessed enough at Duke to have a sleep therapist come in and talk to us a couple of different times. And they talked to us about the importance of sleep and the importance of rest. And they had examples of championship teams um, from years past that did sleep studies on the reflection of how better they perform when they monitored their sleep patterns. You know, that's one of the things that you've got to control. But whether it's sleep or not, in order for you to be as good as you can be on your job, you've got to at some point in time let your job go. It's okay to be able to sit down and grab your remote control and not have to worry about drawing up plays. It's okay to be able to sit down with your family and talk about how their day went and not have a scowl on your face or being upset so that they won't approach you because they know how your attitude is when you've had a bad game or you've had a bad day. You never want at any point in life to intimidate your children because those are the most important people that you'll ever coach. And those are the people that you'll be coaching for the rest of your life. 
if you ever get to the point to where your children don't want to approach you, you definitely need to reevaluate yourself and to change your way. The other thing you've got to be able to do is you've got to be able to go to the mirror and be honest with yourself. You've got to be able to go to the mirror, ask yourself hard questions, and give yourself honest answers about yourself. Because we can live in a world of denial if we trick ourselves into doing that. But you don't want to live in a situation of denial. You want to live in a situation of reality. And if I can walk out of the house every day knowing that I need to go to work and apologize to somebody that I may have mistreated the day before, I'm going to do that. If I can say that, you know what, I need to be a little different in approaching somebody because maybe they didn't respond to me the day before, I need to do that. You always got to, as a coach, understand that your way is not the only way. You have to be versatile enough to be able to deal with people in situations a variety of different ways in order to be an effective leader. When you're coaching, I think one of the things that makes that easy is knowing your why. Why do you do what you do? For me, the most important thing for me um, as a coach is knowing that every single day I'm doing something to make the life of some young man better in some way. And that's the driving force for me. You know, I have no idea, you know, how many championships I'm going to win as a head coach. I have no idea how I'm going to be remembered as a coach. I have no idea if I'm going to become a head coach. But what I can promise you is this. Years from now, I'm going to always have wedding pictures and baby pictures in my phone because my guys are going to think that much of me to be able to send those things to me. And that's not because of how many games we won. It's because I know as a person what I'm willing to pour into them as men. And I'm going to give that to them because I'm in complete control of that. I can't control our record. I can't control what accolades they win or don't win. But I can control when they reflect back upon me how they think about me. And I think if those things are important to you as a coach, you're going to be remembered as a good coach. A good coach is much bigger than X's and O's. A good coach is much bigger than wins and losses. A good coach is a person that made a difference in the life of someone else. And you continue to make a difference in that person's life. And you leave that door open for them to return to you because you may be that on, only source that they have. You know, for me, when I look at um, good and bad, I try not to have bad days. And I'm dead serious about that. You know, I have bad things that happen, but I'm in complete control of whether or not I term a day a bad day. Because for me, as long as I'm alive, as long as I'm breathing, it's not a bad day. Now, bad things happen that may upset me, that may make me sad, that may hurt my feelings, or that may leave me with pain. But for every one thing I can find to complain about coaches, I can find 10 things to be thankful for. And you can control that. You lose a ball game, but you know what? Your family is safe. They got good health. Okay? Somebody write bad things about you on the internet. Somebody write bad things about you in the paper. That's all well and good. But you know what? You've got a beautiful wife at home that loves you. Your parents are still alive. You have the blessing of being able to pick up the phone and call your mother and your father. Those are things that you can't put a price tag on. You get fired for your job. Well, guess what? You've got the ability to go get another one. So you can go in one direction or another when bad things happen for you, but that's your choice. I think we have a choice every time we do something to complain or to count your blessing. And one thing I've come to find out in life is complaining only affects you the majority of the time. And that's most of the time in a negative way. And negativity, guys, is exhausting. Negativity is one of those things that if you are around it, if you're the cause of it, it becomes mentally draining to you. Just think about yourself when you're around people that are always negative or people that you've been around in life that were always negative. How did you think about that? Well, why would you want to be the person that makes somebody else feel the way those negative people made you feel? When you're in a positive mindset, you're going to make other people around you positive. And when you make other people around you positive as a coach, you're going to have good practices. You're going to have good output. And you're going to enjoy what you do. Coaching is a stressful job if you allow it to be. 
But if you're doing it for the right reason, you never lose. Because regardless of what your record is, if you're passionate about making a difference in the life of someone, every single day that you call yourself a coach, you're winning. Because nobody's going to care about your wins and losses years from now. You're not going to be judged on that. You're going to be judged on some young man telling his own son that you made a difference in his life. You're going to be judged on somebody repeating one of your sentences one day to change the life or the situation of somebody else. When you start to hear your players echo your words, that's when you know you're making a difference. When you get your players to the point where they're finishing your sentences, that's when you know you're making a difference. When you get your players to the point to where they are telling other players things that you were going to say before you actually say them, that's when you know that you're making a difference. And my philosophy is very simple. Nothing positive comes from being negative. So rid yourself of the negativity. So as you're coaching, I'm going to flip this a little bit to football. One of the things we like to do um, for our players, and I started this many, many years ago, is I always like to start my meetings off with something positive. So next slide. Next slide. Now, if you look at that, you heard him read that early today, and you can just kind of stare at that about all the different things that always play to win means. And my version of always play to win may be completely different than yours. But I think each coach on here needs to come up with a plan of always play to win. And the thing about everything that you see on the screen here, none of these things take talent. None of these things take time. All these things take is a commitment to being that. So come up with your plan to win, whatever it may be. And your plan to win doesn't have to be displayed anywhere. It doesn't have to be something that somebody can go and envision, but it has to be something that you live by. And you have to be able to go back to your plan to win and look at it when nobody else is around to make sure that you're sticking to the plan. There may be some things in your plan you take out. There may be other things in your plan that you add. But it's very, very important, guys, to have a plan to win in order to win. Because everybody must have a blueprint that they follow in order to be successful. And the only way that we can critique ourselves is to make sure that we're being truthful to and with ourselves. Okay? Next slide. Now, what I like to do um, with my players is I like to start my meetings off. And it doesn't have to be a PowerPoint. It can be something that you write on a board. It can be something that you give them a handout. But I like to start my players off every single day um, with something that's non-football related. The first thing I like to do with my players is I like to see their faces. I like to look in their eyes. Um, make sure you go to the front of the room, you take a look at them, and look in their eyes to see what's going on with them. Because the worst thing you can do is to have a plan that you're trying to get instilled, to have things that you're trying to get taught in a meeting, and you don't know the mindset or the mental set of the young men that you're trying to teach. Somebody could have lost their grandmother. Somebody could have just gotten a call that somebody in their family sick. Somebody could have had a breakup with their girlfriend. That may be something that you say, okay, be tougher than that. But if that's going to distract him from being able to pay attention all day, that's something that you may need to direct. But what it does more than anything is it lets you demand control of your room and it lets them know on a repeated level that you actually care about them as people. So the first thing we do every day is we come up with a quote of the day. How are you? Uh, this quote here is one of my favorite quotes of my own. It's in my book. And the quote reads, everything you do in life is an interview because you never know who's watching or what they're looking for. That right there has everything to do with everything that they're ever going to do. It's football related. It's classroom related. It's how they walk, talk. It's what they do on social media. Everything about this statement can apply to every young man that you're coaching at your teach. But it also applies to you. 
you must understand as a coach that this statement here applies to you. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Every single day, guys, as a coach, you're interviewing with the players that you're coaching. They're watching, they're observing, and they're taking mental notes. They may not be writing down in their notebooks what they think about you, but they're watching you. And when they leave you and when you're out of their presence, that's going to be the motivation that they have to give you their all or the lack of motivation they have to give you their all. That's up to you. And every single day, this changes. And it can be something that you come up with as a coach that you think they may need to hear. It can be something that you saw um, in the newspaper, on the internet. But make sure that it's something that grasps their attention. You need to know who's sleepy. You need to know who's focused. You need to know who's giving you eye contact every single day. Don't ever get in the habit of walking into a meeting, sitting in the back of the room, or walking into a meeting and turning the lights off. Make sure you make eye contact with those young men. Okay, next slide. Okay, the next thing, today's expectations. Okay, we have a thought of the day, and the next thing is today's expectations. And today's expectations can be something that's football related. It can be something that's life related, okay? It may be something that when you were watching film, you saw that they may need to hear. It may be something that um, you saw on television. It, it may be a life event. It can be a variety of different things. This one right here says very simply, excel at the things which take no talent, okay? The things that take no talent, listening, honesty, being trustworthy, being on time. It's important that you understand as a coach, you're probably the most effective teacher that these young men have because they're gonna be more interested in sports than they are in math. They're gonna be more interested in sports than they are history. They're gonna be more interested in sports than they are chemistry or biology. So you have the power every single day as a coach to teach them something that they're gonna carry with them for the rest of their life. And that's probably one of the favorite things that I like to tell my guys, always aim to excel at the things which take no talent. Because if you aim to excel at the things which take no talent on a consistent basis, you're going to generally be better than your competition because most people fail to excel at things that take no talent. Okay, the third part we do in every meeting. Next slide. Okay, I call my defensive backs cheaters. And the reason I call my defensive back cheaters is I think the characteristics of the animal, a cheetah, are very similar to the characteristics of a defensive back. But my whole point in that is giving them a visual of something that they can feel like they're a part of, okay? I was always fascinated by cheetahs as a child. And I used to watch it on television, but when I think about what a cheetah does when it hunts, it has ex very good eye discipline. Eye discipline is something that we try to teach in the game of football. When you're going to tackle a guy, you have to have your eyes fixated on his hips. When you're in pursuit, you have to have your eyes fixated on his hips. When you're covering a guy, you have to have your eyes fixated on his hips. So you can take a video of a cheetah chasing an antelope, a gazelle, a wildebeest, a zebra, or whatever it may be. And as you watch the precision of its eyes, it's always fixated on the hip, okay? Cheetahs are fast. They're explosive. They're elite. They're the fastest animals in the world. So that gives my guys something that they can feel a sense of pride about being a part of. But the unique thing about cheetahs is they usually hunt by themselves. But when they do hunt together, they will only hunt with their brothers. Well, we're trying to get all of these young men that play this sport to understand that you will sacrifice for your brother. But the unique part about it is a pack of cheetahs has a unique name, which is called a coalition. And that's a pack of male cheetahs made up only of brothers. Well, when cheetahs hunt together, each one of them have a job. And it's nothing that they ever practice. It's instinctive. They know they're too small to take down a certain size animal. But each animal has to take the proper angle in order to be able to have a successful hunt. Each animal has to know to attack the animal at a different part of his body to be able to wear it down to get it on the ground. They have to be able to balance their weight to get it off of his feet so they can get a good grasp on the neck. Well, that's a very, very clear picture of everything that you're trying to get 
young men to do when you're trying to instill the importance of team. So you can show guys things in everyday life and understand, make them understand the importance of teamwork. So the cheetah reminders are very simple. Regardless of what happens, finish what you start. So what I'm trying to make guys understand when I say regardless of what happens, finish what you start. You're not always going to be more talented than your competition. You're not always going to be as fast as your competition. You're going to fall down on some plays. There are going to be some things that happen. You may miss a tackle. But the one key element here is the word finish. And I'm going to constantly remind these guys the importance of finish. Because five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, they won't be playing football no more. But they're still going to have to finish the things that they start. So the more I word this and the more I tell them things like this as the most important teacher that they have, the more they'll carry these lessons with them in life. Okay, next slide. Now, the last thing is what I call a cheetah law. And as I told you, I call my position group cheaters. And cheetah law is exactly what it says. A cheetah law is something that we live by. A cheetah law is something that no matter what happens, I'm going to be able to bring this up and ask these young men, are you obeying the cheetah laws? And a cheetah law is very simple. We can't control our talent or ability level, but we are always 100% in control of our effort. And again, that's a life lesson. That's something that you can teach your best player, and that's something that you can teach your most untalented player to all keep them on the same page. A guy that follows this will oftentimes take over a guy that has more talent if he doesn't follow this. And effort is just one of those things that will allow you to win when you may not be as talented. You know, we always talked about um, when I was at Duke University that it didn't matter the talent level of our opponent if we could get them to the fourth quarter because we felt like our effort would enable us to be able to meet more talent people because our effort was going to be such a priority that we were going to be in good shape. And you don't have to condition as much when you make effort a standard. And once it's made a standard, you never deviate from it. Never allow your good players not to uphold your standards because good players are your best leaders or they could be your worst influences. If you allow a good player to get away with something that you stated to be a standard, you've compromised everybody else in that room trying to live up to that standard. Coach your good players the hardest because they're the ones that the other players are looking at. And when you get your good players doing things, that's your leadership. And your good players are your leaders when you're not around. They're your leaders in the locker room. They're your leaders in the school. They're your leaders when they go hang out together. If you get them doing the right thing, if you get them on the same page, they're going to be the people that echo who you are. Okay, next slide. Build something amongst your team, amongst your group, that they have to uphold every day. I told you that a pack of cheetahs was called a coalition. And I have something called a coalition creed. And it's very simple. I will be better today than I was yesterday. And I will be better tomorrow than I was today. It's no more complicated than that. Now, let's fast forward 30 years. This is something that they can still use. But more importantly, this is something that you have to live by as a coach in order to be able to get them to live by. This is something that you can pull up every single day and ask a guy, do you feel like you held true to that? And this is just something that I have had in my meeting room for years and I'm having a sign to get made and put in my new meeting room that I want them to remember and to be able to recite to their own children one day. And yours doesn't have to be this, but come up with something that your guys live by and come up with something that establishes a tradition. Come up with something that the guys that you coached years ago can come back and see the guys that you currently coach and they share this thing in common. Okay, next slide. Go back one.
These one? Okay. Yeah, okay that's now, good. in conclusion of this, before I open it up for questions for you guys, one of the things that I've learned in life is the best example you can be is a walking example of what to be. And I think that's very important for every man to understand in life. What you want your players to become, you have to be an example of. Who you expect them to be, you have to be. And again, that's something that takes no talent, but it does take a commitment. So what I want to do right now um, is turn it back over, and I guess we'll answer questions. Coaches, do you have any question? Tienen alguna pregunta, coaches? I think no questions, coach. No. Thank you. Was there anything in the chat that you needed to check? Yes, but no, only greetings. Okay, well go to the next slide and I'll talk to him about my social media stuff. Well guys, one of the things that I've been able to do um, in coaching is I've been able to use social media as a way to be able to reach people. And I use my Twitter account to put a lot of stuff up about always play to win, a lot of information about the game of football, but most importantly, about the game of life. And my social media account is one of those things that you're going to always be, see positive material on there. But I think it's important for all you guys to understand uh, how important it is to coach your players on social media. Uh, social media is something that can work for you or against you. And as coaches, don't ignore the things that could possibly affect your entire team on social media. It's very important, guys, that you have somebody on your staff to keep an eye on these young men's social media accounts because they're young kids. It's important that they understand what's appropriate to post and what's not appropriate to post. It's important they understand who's appropriate to follow and who's not appropriate to follow. If you're a high school coach and you have young men that are expecting to get recruited, um, they have to understand that college coaches are going to go to their social media pages and look at the content that they like, uh, follow, uh, tweet, retweet, or share. And sometimes that can be the difference in them getting a scholarship or not. You know, the thing I always say is, if you wouldn't say it in a job interview, don't put it on social media. And that goes for us too as coaches. I'm very, very conscious about anything I say on social media, anything I do on social media. You know, I'm a very public person as far as my family life, but there's just certain things that I'm not going to do out of respect for Texas Tech University and out of respect for my position. And I think all of us got to follow that. You know, you represent a university, you represent a high school, or you represent an organization. So always understand that. But also, guys, social media is a great source of communication. You know, that's how I met Coach, you know, him following me on Twitter, and he ran into me at the AFCA convention, and we were able to form a friendship, which has enabled me to be able to come here and share with you guys tonight. What other avenue would I ever had to be able to talk with uh, guys from all across the world about one common goal that we have together? And I'm open to any of you guys uh, reaching out to me at any time. Um, right there, you see my Twitter. You see my Instagram. Um, my website is ap2w.com. If you're interested in purchasing the book, um, it's on there. We have apparel. Or if you're just interested in letting somebody listen to that clip that you heard, if you think it may uh, be able to benefit you. Okay, I see a question here. How do you handle players that think they know everything and hard to coach? I think that's a very good question. And I think um, it's very important that you address those things as soon as you see them happen. You know, players do oftentimes get in situations where they think that they have all the answers. But to be honest with you, what I've found out most of the time, when you deal with a young man that's hard to coach, his biggest problem is his pride. Guys are oftentimes afraid to be corrected or critiqued in front of their peers. And that's something that you address with the entire group. And what I like to do is I like to use examples of myself to teach my young men. 
I have examples from my past in life where I spoke at the mouth the wrong way or I did something and it cost me. So instead of always just chastising them, I like to give them stories of why I learned that it doesn't make sense to talk back or the benefit. The thing I always like to reference with my guys in particular is they all want to play professional football and they all talk about playing in the NFL. Well, I ask them very clearly when they want to mouth off or talk back to me or they hard to coach. I say, what do you think would happen if you were in an NFL camp and a coach said something to you and you opened your mouth to say something back? And you know what they say? I would get cut. You're right. You would get cut. And it just makes them look at things a little bit differently when you know that something's very, very important to them. And then furthermore, you ask them, say, what if a college coach called me or an NFL scout called me and told me to tell them about your attitude? What do you expect me to say if every time I try to correct you, you have something to say? Or every time I try to correct you, you talk back? And it's amazing the response you'll get when you paint a picture to them of something that they know could possibly cost them. But the thing of it is, I always address with them the importance of not letting pride get in your way. I tell them all the time, we're a unit. And you can't, there can't be embarrassment within a unit. So I think once you address the issues that you have, it makes things a little bit easier. Next question. Coach, do you have any advice to coach players who believe that they can't do something? You know, I think um, when it comes to not being able to do something, you have to make players understand the importance of being as good as they can be at what it is that they're doing. Because oftentimes when they think they can't do something, they've already intimidated themselves out of doing it. And what you do again is I go back to my failures. As a coach, you have to understand that they look up to you. They look to you for answers. So what you do is you just talk to them about something that – you didn't think you could do it at some point in life, but you were able to accomplish it and how you were able to accomplish that. Guys like to hear personal stories from their leaders. That's why I think it's very important as coaches that we're transparent. You can never come off to your players as being a perfect leader. I think you have to be open about your imperfections when you're a leader. That way they can relate to you. But always make them understand how they can achieve something with being as good as they can be because you can find a way to point out the weaknesses of other guys that don't do that. And always show them videos of people that are successful now that were at some point not so successful. It's always easy to go be able to get film of NFL guys, NBA guys that were not as good when they were a certain point, but through hard work, through believing what they've been able to accomplish. But I, I just believe in being able to go find stories and situations that they can relate to and apply those to themselves. Another question here, Coach. Co coach, how do you deal with the staff that doesn't share your vision or perspective on how to coach? You know, I think that's a great question. And I think the thing that you have to do uh, when you're in a situation like that is you have to make them understand your why, why it works. You have to make them understand and give them, I guess, details of how it works. And use scenarios of organizations, companies, teams that have failed because of lack of um, people being on the same page. You know, I think you have to paint examples of the importance of everybody having one cause. You know, acknowledge the fact that you respect what they know. Acknowledge the fact that you respect their professionalism and their ability, but also show them how there can be weaknesses if everybody in the room isn't on the same page. You know, usually when something like that happens, again, you're dealing with egos, you're dealing with personalities. So the worst thing you can do in that situation is attack somebody directly because you need that person working for you. But again, I think if you can go find examples and, you know, it, it comes from great leaders. You know, you, you got great coaches that have um, coached a variety of different sports that have things on YouTube that you can show and be able to go research and find literature of situations to where organizations failed 
because people were not on the same page. What you will do then is you will silently let them know that you don't appreciate them not being loyal, but at the same time, you'll show them that you're intelligent enough to still be professional and show them how their attitude could possibly cause a weakness within you guys' organization. Coach, how do you manage the actual situation to maintain your players' focus and the eyes on the target? Do you have a method to measure leadership in each one of your players? Uh, the first thing uh, about the eyes on the target, I think uh, eye discipline is something that you have to coach just like any other fundamental. Um, I think as a coach, you have to measure eye discipline in your drills. One of the things that I do in practice is, Every drill, I get to where I can see the eyes of my players because that's one thing that I can't see on film. And that's one thing that I can correct um, right away. And the thing that I make a point to do is I always repeat myself talking about the importance of eyes. And like I say, I show my young man um, videos of cheetahs and their eyes hunting. I show my young man videos of great players like Deion Sanders, great players like Charles Woodson, that have made plays with their eyes. But they're gonna hear me talk about the importance of eye discipline on a regular basis to where I start to hear them become about it. Any drill that you do, you're doing it because you want your players to get good at it. But eye discipline is something that doesn't happen overnight. And it's probably the causes the most mistakes in football. And it's whether you're playing offensive line, defensive line, linebacker, it doesn't make a difference what position you play. Eye discipline is something that is essential. So you have to, as a coach, make sure that you're making it a top priority from your teaching. And the other one was about leadership. What was it, coach? Do, do you have a method to measure leadership in each one of your players? Yes, definitely. I think um, I measure leadership by um, having guys to term themselves with one word. And we do an exercise where – I make them give me a one word description of themselves. And that one word description of themselves is how they feel they are. Loyal, hungry, dependable, whatever that word may be. And once they give me the one word description of themselves, I write that word down. And what I do then is I hold them accountable to that. But when they give me a one word description of themselves, I also make them give me a supporting reason as to why they think that because what can happen is a guy can tell you that he's dependable that's his one word description and then you say well give me a reason why you're dependable and their reason may not match their word and you have to paint a picture to them and you have to hold them constantly accountable for that because young guys oftentimes are not going to be mature enough to be effective leaders but what you always have to do is you always have to show guys how their one word description matches their habits. And an easy way to do that is ask a person what their goals are and whatever their goals are, keep a record of it. Now what you do is you keep a record of their behavior and you constantly go to them and quiz them on whether their habits are reflective of their goals a guy can tell me that he wants to go to the nfl but if he's always late if he's disruptive in study hall if i always have to correct him on things that he's supposed to do if i have to constantly remind him to excel at things that take no talent he's lying to me about the nfl being his goals because his habit doesn't mimic those things and it goes the same with leadership ask them what their definition of leadership is and make sure that their habits mimic what they feel like the characteristics of leadership are. How do you reach a player who doesn't know their strengths and weaknesses? Make him feel important. Make him understand what you view to be his strengths and weaknesses, and he will feed off of how you visualize him. Oftentimes when guys don't understand their strengths or weaknesses, they're in denial or they're self-conscious, they're insecure. It goes one way or another. But what you do, again, you paint visual pictures to them of how they can accomplish something if they do more of this or they do less of that. 
each and every person, we can always find a way to give them a positive outlook. Hey, man, if you got a little bit more sleep, you may lose a little more weight. You may be in better shape. You may get a little bit faster. If you eat better, you know, you, you may be a little stronger. So always find weaknesses, but turn it into a positive. If you do less of this, you can be better at that. And when they get to the point to where they don't want to accept their weaknesses, make them understand if you do accept your weaknesses, you can accomplish this. Again, find out what their goals are and show them how they can obtain those goals. What do you think is the best way to follow up on a player's development? Um, I think to keep a measuring account um, for that. I think the best way to understand as a coach how a player is developing is to make a running account of how they were and how they are, if you understand what I'm saying. And you have to constantly measure that. And what you want to do is you want to show them the improvement that they're making so that they continue to strive for success in that area. How do you start to transition to a new philosophy when, when you're with a new staff on a team or a change of head coach? Um, I think um, you go in showing your confidence in what you're trying to instill. That's the most important thing because, you know, one thing that's inevitable is change is going to come at some point. And again, it goes back to what I talked about earlier. You're teaching guys life lessons in this situation. And you're teaching them that at some point in time in life, things are going to change. Um, they're going to have different coaches. They're going to have different bosses. They're going to have different leaders um, in situation. And making them understand that one way is not the only way. But at the same time, make them understand that you believe in your way. Because players are going to mimic you. Players are going to mimic your habits. Players are going to mimic your behavior. But most importantly, players are going to mimic your confidence. If you have confidence in what you're doing and you have ways to back it up in the way you present it, if you have film to show it working, they'll get on board sooner or later. Coach, how do you, how do you transition players to have a winner mentality who've never been in a winning culture? Again, I think it goes back to making them understand what it takes to win. And you show them small victories. You know, you can't go into a situation saying, okay, we only won two ball games, we're going to win 10. Because that may be very, very unrealistic. But I think you have to deal with each individual in a situation like that. And you have to deal with the mentality. It goes back to what I showed you guys about putting things up that they live by, you know. I will be better today than I was yesterday, and I will be better tomorrow than I was today. That's an easy formula right there for making guys grasp from a winning mentality. And what you can do each and every day is you can show these young men how they are better today than they were yesterday. And then you tell them how they can be better tomorrow. And you measure those small victories. You know, you may lose the next ball game, but you find an area where they improved and you don't dwell on the loss, you dwell on the small victories. And after a while, it becomes contagious. But more importantly, you have to be a person to make them believe that they can win. When I got to Duke University, we had won, uh, Duke University had won 10 games in eight years when we got there. They had four seasons where they had not won a ball game. And they were probably the worst uh, Division I football team in America. Well, one thing that Coach Cutcliffe made us believe is these kids are going to mimic our attitude. These kids are going to mimic our mentality. They're going to mimic our belief system. So what we did was made sure that we said nothing negative. We didn't give an excuse as to why we couldn't win. And the only thing we did was talk about what it's going to take to win. And eventually we got it to the point to where we were able to play for conference championships and we've made it into a very respectful program. Um, anybody else have any other questions? Let me give it a second to see if somebody types some more code. I think we might have hit them all. Okay. Well, Coach, I'll turn it back over to you. I think 
no more uh, questions, Coach. Coach Jones, I'm very grateful for spending time to share your philosophy with us. Believe me that this life study you lead and share with us will be very useful for, for all of us. I hope to see you soon. Well, I thank you. Maybe next time in Cancun, coach. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully when this pandemic passes, we may be able to do that. Yes, of course. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it, coach. Thank you very much. Okay.